Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Uh, Pastor Mauricio, before he left, asked me if I talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. So I prayed a little bit to find out what God might want to do. And God gave me um, a number of things, but you got to hone them down and, and get right down to the bone of things. I, I've got a, uh, eight things that move the Holy Spirit. Uh, I believe there's a lot of confusion about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People have different ideas. And I'm, I'm not here to say that somebody's belief is wrong or that mine is right, but uh, I have to share 30 years of experience in walking with God and things that I've seen. Um, the, the first thing is invitation. If you could put Luke 11, 13 up there on the board. Uh, this was the scripture that they always used to invite people up. If you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Uh, that's a, an amazing scripture because the qualification for the Holy Spirit is a simple prayer of asking, right? A prayer of faith. And uh, I've seen people go up to receive the Holy Spirit. And they struggled with it. And my personal experience was initially a struggle. And I've seen other people just, bam, they just get hit. And I'm thinking, what? What's wrong with me, right? And so my experience was in a Word of Faith church probably back in the late 80s maybe. And uh, they taught on the Holy Spirit. There was a man of God there named Ed Dufresne who just had an anointing like I'd never seen in my life. I could get your whole body quake just from sitting in the front row. It was amazing. And so when they said, who would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I said, I don't know what that means, but if it's that, I want some. So I went forward, and, of course, you raise your hands, and then the elders come, and they lay hands on you, and they begin to pray and go down the line and then tell you, Okay, pray this prayer, and you ask to receive the Holy Spirit. Now they say, okay, now just pray. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Okay, you've been doing a series on thinkers, and I'm a thinker. I'm way up in my head all the time, so I didn't have the childlike faith. To go, okay, Rapa. I'm like, wait a minute. Let me reason. Let me figure this out. How does it work? I'm not quite sure. And I got in my own way, basically. And uh, my experience was is that because I didn't really get good teaching on it, I'm sitting there with my arms up waiting to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and when nothing happened because I had inner image issues to begin with, I'm thinking, well, it's for everybody but me. I don't know if you ever had that kind of struggle. God loves everybody but me because, you know, my life was really messed up, right? I didn't get saved until I was 30. And me and the devil hung out a lot for 30 years. <laughs> And so I, I, you know, the devil will want to convince you that you're disqualified, right? So, uh, and the usher that was there praying for me, he didn't, you know, he was an elder and an usher, but he just like, well, brother, you know, just, you, you got it. Well, I was disappointed with that. And uh, so I left, and somebody invited me to a Bible study in Sunland, and it was a retired theologian from Life Bible College college that Amy Simple McPherson started. So I'm thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. So I go there and he's teaching on grace and it was amazing. And we just felt so blessed because there was only a handful of people in his house. And the only reason that we got in to do it is because we were gardeners, landscapers. And one of the guys that was a friend of mine did his yard and pushed him and pushed him and pushed him to start a Bible study until he finally agreed. So we were like in like Flint. We were the people they were able to get squeeze the last bit of juice out of this guy before he went home to be with Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he died in a year. Yeah, we got one year Bible son. He passed away. But we got some good nuggets. But the point was is he challenged me. <laughs> he challenged me and said, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? Do you pray in tongues? I said, well, uh, I went forward and I prayed for it, but I didn't get it. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, I didn't get it. He goes, did you pray? I said, yeah. He said, did you ask? He said, yeah. Do you know the scripture? Well, yes, I do. So then God's a liar. No, you know, he's cornering me, right? And he said, look, you, you can receive. He said, he said, if you prayed, then you did receive the Holy Spirit, but you did not yield to the manifestation. And I'm like, okay, I'm still up in my head, right? And then he said, 
bro, the reason that you didn't pray is because you're self-conscious, you're nervous, you're afraid that you might do something that's really not the Holy Spirit, and everybody's going to go, <gasps> you know, and you're in that crowd, and, and you already got inner image issues anyway, and you didn't want to magnify that insecurity, and so you just waited to be possessed. <laughs> so he said, you know, dude, I'm not going to press you right now to pray here at this Bible study, but he said, I want you on the way home to yield to the manifestation. So I, I get in the car, I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, oh, this is ridiculous. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what yielding to the manifestation looks like. And I, and I actually had an attitude. I don't know if you ever had an attitude when you were a young believer, but <laughs> I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, I don't know what to do. I can't believe you put me in this position, you know, dialoguing with God. And I'm like, I'm going to do just whatever comes, and if it's ridiculous, the egg's going to be on your face, not mine. Because you told me to do it, but it seems dumb, right? And literally, I, I actually said this. I, I, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I just kind of like, <sighs> Abba Zabba, GGD, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm just throwing out, you know, like, because I wanted to underscore that I felt ridiculous, right? But I kept saying stuff that sounded stupid out of my head, and then all of a sudden, it, it started to shift. And when it started to shift, it started to flow. And when it started to flow effortlessly, then I started to feel lightness, like I could actually almost levitate. And then I went, oh, my God, it's real. And I was really excited about it. But, but my intellect robbed me of that initial experience. And it took a man to minister to me and build faith to receive. Now, I took somebody else that worked for me that was a drug addict, a little kid, and, and he was a thief, right? I mean, and, and I took him, and I'm thinking, man, if I could just get him saved. So I took him, he went to the altar, he gives his life to Christ, and so he wants to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, me? So I said, okay, pray this prayer. And I'm like, what? That's not fair. How does that happen? But it happens, right? So the next thing I had to do to continue my journey and maybe, you know, I've got a sequence here and all of us are somewhere on this sequence. The next one is some people just need to believe by faith that they've received. I took a man to build me up and, and tell me what the word said about it before I could believe for it on the way home. Uh, there's a verse up there for faith, 1 John 5.14. Um, and it's the verse, I believe, that says, if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if he hears us, then we have the petitions of him that we desire. Some people don't have faith to receive because they don't even know that it's the will of God for their life. You know, some people think that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for the apostles so they could launch the church. But now that the church has been launched, we just need the word. That's not true. God's no respecter of persons. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what they had then, we can have now, Right? And so I realized that I needed to build my faith to believe for all of the things that God had for me. And uh, I was in a meeting one time, and somebody spoke a word, and you've probably heard it a million times. It's almost a platitude these days. But it was, if you want something you've never had, you've got to do something you've never done. And even though I'd heard it before, God put wind on it this time, and it rained. And I went, whoa, what God? What could I possibly do that I haven't already done? And then he said, you know, you got to know who you are, not just who I am, because I wired you differently than other people, and you need to reach from me through your own wiring and through your own process. You know, I'm up here teaching, but I, I had C's and D's all through school because I'm a visual learner, but, but the school system doesn't teach you, or at least when I was there, we didn't have the visual computers and that sort of thing. I mean, they basically talked and gave you boring stories to read, you know. <laughs> And they'd bait you in and, oh, we're going to teach on the Civil War. Awesome. I love the Civil War. And they give you all the politics of the Civil War, none of the battles. And I'm like, I am so bored. <laughs> right? And so, you know, I, I don't believe students fail. I believe, I believe teachers fail. Right? Because they don't understand how the students are wired and how, they, how to teach them. Right? So the Lord told me I was a visual learner. And, of course, you know, uh, over in Joshua 1, 8, it says, meditate on the word of God day and night, then and only then when you have good success. So you've got to live in the word. You know, you've got to eat, sleep, and drink it. But I had to paint it. So I created a, uh, an imagery book. And I had one for the Holy Spirit. 
and I would create uh, confessions here that I would make on the side, but I also made an image. Now, I'm, I'm not a graphic designer, but I do know how to go into a magazine with an X-Acto knife, okay? <laughs> and so I, I created this image here of me getting anointed with all the angels present going, amen, right? And then I have all these verses that I build into myself. Lord, let my garments be always white. Let my head lack no ointment. I love righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, even my God, anoints me with the oil of gladness above my fellows. Right? So I just confess all these things. You have to build faith into your spirit. Right? By meditating on it day and night. Confession is powerful. Imagery is powerful. Put them together. Right? Right? I mean, I, I have a class that I wrote called Word Guided Imagery where I even get my smells involved, right? But that's another time. <laughs> so the next one, i got to go back and find my... <sighs> Help me, Jesus. I got a funny story, God. I, I don't have time for my story. I'll tell you sometime, though, because it involves Pastor Mauricio and me, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'll bring it back, bring it back. The next one, number three, is persistence, Luke 11, 9. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. One translation says, seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. So there's a persistence that God wants to uh, cultivate in us, that, that bulldog faith that Pastor Mauricio has, Right? You know, would my wife feel loved if I just went up and say, you know, would you maybe consider maybe going out to dinner with me sometime? And then, and she says, well, I'm busy for, I knew it. I guess, and, you know, and then I never ask her again, right? You know, but I mean, I went after this girl for two years, man. So persistence paid off in the end, right? But God wants us to knock and keep on knocking to be the importune woman that we read about in the scriptures, right? Why? Because he wants to be valued. Anything you value, you pursue, right? And if you value it a lot, you pursue it hard and long. In uh, the Song of Songs, the Shulamite woman is looking for her beloved, and she's going everywhere. Have you seen him, right? And no, I haven't seen him, and she's just traveling all over town looking for the one she loves, right? Well, that's flattering for the person who's the object of your love. God created us for relationship, right? He likes to be pursued. You know, God's not moved by casual interest, right? He's moved by passion. Okay. Number four, hunger. Deuteronomy 8.3, this is an awesome one. So he humbled you, talking God to the people, and he allowed you to hunger, and he fed you with manna, which you did not nor know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, uh, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is a, a good one here because before we get saved, we all cope with pressure in different ways. My dad was a, an alcoholic, a passive alcoholic. When pressure came on him, he drank. Some people do drugs. Some people pursue sexual interests, right? Sometimes it's just hobbies, whatever it is. That when you're under pressure, you go to, to relieve pressure, to shut down the thoughts, is a counterfeit secret place, right? And sometimes I would get mad at God as a young believer, and I said, you know, I'm done. You know, you promised this, and you're not meeting my timeline, so we're done, right? And you walk away, and you hope he follows, you know, <laughs> right? And one day I did that. I said, I'm out of here. Right? When you're ready to be real with me, I'll be over here fishing. <laughs> right? And I took my pole, and I'm driving down the road, and uh, he spoke to me and said, son, I never told you it was going to be easy. I only told you it was going to be worth it. It rocked my world. It's a, it's a bigger story than that. I'll share it another time because there's imagery attached to that as well. But, you know, I don't mind being told difficult things. I just don't like being ignored. Right? Because when you're being ignored... You don't know whether you're in or out. I remember one time I thought I was the off-scouring of the earth, and I got a letter from a, a pastor, if I mention his name, you know him, and he said, the Lord told me to tell you that you are highly esteemed. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm turning this over, right, because I didn't believe it. Sometimes you're better off than you think you are, 
right? And so I like God to encourage me or even spank me once in a while. I just want to know you're there, right? That you care about my bad behavior and my bad move enough to pull me, you know, pull on my choke chain, so to speak. God wants to crucify your counterfeit hiding places. And sometimes when you hold on to things, sometimes you, 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 know, you find out that God is the real secret place, that the presence of the Holy Spirit is joy, but you've so steeped yourself in old habit patterns that when pressure comes, you're torn between praising God and trying to get into a place with God so that the pressure leaves or going back to old gods fishing or sin, right? Whatever you used to do that would bring a moment of relief and then I'll deal with the consequences tomorrow. We have to crucify that. We can't embrace. uh, uh, And sometimes God will come along and help you. Children of Israel in the wilderness, can God provide water? Can God provide quail? He said, I gave you manna. Our manna is when pressure comes, we go to the word of God. The word of God is manna. But it's just the word. I've got this soul hunger. I've got leanness of soul because of all the pressure. And the word will fill your soul. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your, your, Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And when your mind or your soul is lean, it's because you haven't put the spirit of God into it. And then pressure comes from the enemy and you have no resources with which to resist him because you weren't in the word. And now all of a sudden, remember what you used to do the last time I came? You went and did that. And you're like, oh, I'm not supposed to do that anymore, but I can't, I can't handle the leanness. So you end up, and then you go, and then you got that terrible conviction because the Holy Spirit's living inside you if you're born again, and you're thinking, oh, I'm being torn in half. Well, it doesn't have to be. God. If, if we can't find a place in us where, where we can say, Lord, I'm done, then he'll say, okay, take all you want. He sent them quail. And this is in the Bible. They ate so much quail that they threw up and the vomit came out their nose. That's a lot of quail. <laughs> right? Some of us, I know I've had some experiences where I had some things that I really didn't give to God right away. And metaphorically speaking, he gave me so much of it, it came out my nose. And when it comes out your nose, trust me, you're dumb. You never go back to that again. You know, I remember going on a vacation once with my parents, going through the desert, 100 miles of whoop de doos right? And they had Oreos and root beer. And so I'm blah, 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 Oreo, blah, 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 Oreo, right? <laughs> Finally, I'm banging on the window, let me out. I ran out in the desert, and I hurled Oreos and root beer all over the desert. Do you know that was like in 1970? And the first root beer I had was last Father's Day since that time? Because my association with root beer was a bad experience, right? Well, God will allow you to have a difficult experience with things you're unwilling to let go of. Trust me. Take the easy road. Just tell him, give me power to move forward. From hunger, if we, if we, if we don't surrender to hunger, guess what's next? Desperation, right? Desperation without relief or hunger without relief brings desperation. But guess what? He who's begun a good work and you will complete it unto the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I like to call it positive desperation. Because God is moving you forward even when it looks like you're going backward. You know, the best thing that ever happened to the prodigal son was a couple nights in a pig pen. Right? Because it humbled him and he went back to the father. Right? And he went back a better person. He was never tempted to go back to where he was before. You know, just like quail came out some people's nose. He had a pig pen experience and said, what was I thinking? And you know, it didn't say that he got over himself. It said he came to himself. So he lost who he was. His identity as a son under his father, he lost that. He went out there and said, what am I doing? This is not me. And he came back to his true identity. He came to himself and he went back to the father never to leave again. Because he never had that identity challenge again. And the father took him and embraced him without rebuke. 
because he recognized that it was a process he needed to go through in order to recognize who he really was. Uh, 1 Samuel uh, 36, we know the story. Samuel takes his men to war, leaves some people with the stuff. Uh, a, a band of Sabines or somebody came and, and, and stole everything they had, including their wives and children. And they're battle weary and they come back and everybody's gone. The camp is gone. The tents are gone. Everything's gone. And these, these boys that fought with him are already on the edge because they just fought a battle they weren't sure they should even be fighting. And they turn on him. Imagine losing everything and having all your best friends turn on you at the same time. That's desperation, right? But what did he do? He had the capacity to encourage himself in the Lord, right? Uh, we can't trust in natural things. We can't even trust in our best friends in times of desperation because God doesn't want us to. He wants us to turn to him in desperate times and see the goodness of the Lord. And God gave him instruction. He said, shall I pursue and recover all? He said, pursue, you will recover all. And they did. And he went, and, you know, and, and David went from zero to hero in 24 hours again, right? After desperation, desperation is the place where you love righteousness and hate iniquity. A lot of us, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. We love God, but we don't hate sin, right? Uh, and so if we don't hate sin, then we're always vulnerable. And God's not going to give power to somebody that's vulnerable. He wants to get you, as Pastor Marisa was teaching, I understand here, the other Wednesday, wants new wineskin for new wine, right? New wineskin is a new way of thinking, right? You're enshrouded in your own thoughts. And if your thoughts are ugly, your wineskin is weak. You can't hold the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit shows up and people dart out the door because they have an unrenewed mind. And when the Holy Spirit and same consciousness come together, you have an Ananias and Sapphira moment, right? People can't handle it. But if you have righteousness consciousness and you know that you've been made the righteousness of God through faith and faith alone and not by performance and the Holy Spirit shows up, you can still have stuff and be okay, right? We all got stuff that we're still dealing with, right? But we invite the Holy Spirit because he's the way out, right? We want that. Desperation leads us to surrender, Matthew 3.12. Let's read that verse. Ah, yes, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out or purge, my Bible says, the threshing floor, and will gather the wheat into the barn, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquestionable fire. So when there's a harvest, right, this isn't wheat, and doesn't even look like wheat, but for the argument, we're going to... Uh, he'll, he'll take this, and there is a husk that is enshrouding the good fruit that we want. So when God harvests us and pulls them into the kingdom, he wants us transformed by the renewing of our mind. Your thought processes are the sheath over the good things that God wants. And if we don't think right, we need to be transformed. And if we don't yield to the way of escape, and it could be prayer and word and fellowship, uh, worship, all of the positive elements, but we just want things to go on, but we want to go to heaven, and God promised that he's going to finish the work that he begun, sometimes he'll let us go through a little threshing process. Now, they don't want to bruise the fruit, so it's not a real whack, but it is a, so how things going today? Yeah? <laughs> cool. Have you been praying? You haven't been reading the word, have you? Okay. I get it. You've been busy, but... How's this feel? Not too good, huh? So how about praying tomorrow? And we got this little dialogue with God, and it's not really comfortable, but we know it's good for us, right? You ever have God take you in an uncomfortable place, and, and yet it's not very comfortable, but you know in the end it's all going to work out, right? So then we got all this thing, and, it, and what it does is it kind of beats the husk off the fruit, and we kind of sweep up this stuff here, and, and we bring it in here, and just pretend you see it, okay? And, and, and then what we do is we, we shake it, and there's different ways that they would do it. Uh, sometimes they would put it in a basket, and they would throw it in the air. And the wind would blow, and it'd take all the chafe, chafe away, but the fruit was heavier, so it would fall back in the basket. And so they would do this process. Sometimes they would have a sifter in the bottom. I was talking to a man of God the other day, and he said, Tim, there's no lifting without sifting. 
And I went, ooh, that's good. Can I use that? And he said, yes, you may. So, so they put the stuff in here, and they shake it. You ever hear the scripture? God's going to shake those things that could be shaken, so the things that can't be shaken will remain? Right. That can be uncomfortable, but it's good. So it's a shaking. It's a throwing up to the air. And uh, the Bible says that his winnowing fan in his hand. Sometimes the process is the, the breaking up, and then there's a wind. And it blows all the chafe away, right? The elements that are on our life that we've been clinging to that don't move us forward, Holy Spirit blows it away, right? So here I am looking at the book of Acts, and they have the Passover meal. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He tells them to go and wait for the promise of the Father. They go to the upper room, and it says when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered together in one place, and suddenly, like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. So what was going on for 50 days? God was dealing with their stuff, right? Preparing them to receive that measure, that baptism of the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of people don't teach about tearing for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's already come. But if you've got stuff, you need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, examine my heart. Let's, let's do some Holy Ghost surgery here because I want to be filled. I want everything that you have. Okay, I'm almost done. So then there is this, this idea of this is the condition of your soul. It's defiled. What God wants is your soul to be renewed in the spirit of his mind. He wants a clean soul. Man, I, 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 I mean, all the stuff I did in 30 years, this is what I look like, right? And then it brought pain to my life, right? And so I asked God, I said, Lord, I need help. I need you to help me and fill me and cleanse me and wash me. And he, he said, all right, son, but there's really not, not much room for me there. And I'm like, well, he said, can I have that? Nah. How about that? Nah. Can't you just like dilute my sin a little bit like that so I feel better? That's what most of us reach out for God. They want help, but they don't want to be full. They want one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom so they, they can play with the world and go to heaven. And that's like, oh, okay, just a little bit. And God said, look, if you knew what I was promising you, you, you would download all that nonsense, right, and empty yourself out so that I could pour myself in you. And can I tell you when Jesus said, I have come, that you might have life and life more abundantly, this is where, where he's talking about. This is what we all really want, even though we don't know it. The devil's deceived us into thinking that this is good, and it's not. It's killing us, right? So this, to me, explained the argument of how come, you know, one kid throws his arms up and gets filled with the Holy Spirit, and other people like me are just like all up in our head and this, that, and the other is because we're all in different processes. We're all in different places. Desperation brings you to the place where you don't want to hold on to this anymore. When you got quail coming out your nose, you're done. And you pour yourself out and you say, Lord, I'm all yours. Catherine Kuhlman said, Lord, here's nothing. If you can take nothing and do something, here's nothing. She didn't have anything to, to give up. And look what she did, man. She changed the world. Then there's calling. Can I tell you, if you know that you're called, it'll, it'll cause you to fight the good, good fight of faith. Jesus saw the bride and it said he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. When you know that God can take you where you were with all your sin and all your baggage and that he wants to clean you and use you so that you can have an influence to change the world, it's like, man, that's better than sin. That's better than the life I was living. And you're reaching for the promise of significance. Pastor Mel once uh, was ministering and I was visiting at his church and I'm sitting in a chair in the front row, like Anthony, I never met the guy, I was just visiting. And he comes over and he puts his foot up right here. <laughs> and he's looking at the congregation and he says, there comes a point in time in every man's life when he's got to trade in his security for significance. And he looks right at me, I'm like, Argh! it was like a bullet. And I realized the church that I'm going to now, I'm secure, they love me unconditionally, everything's awesome, but I'm not doing anything. I'm coming and getting on board with this man because he's teaching significance and I want my life to make a difference. 
I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant, don't you? Praise God. And then the last one was worship. And this is my last story. I remember watching Christian television once. And it was uh, R.W. Schombach. He's an old uh, healing evangelist. He was the armor bearer for William Brannan. And a guy moved in uh, Signs and Wonders. And uh, he travels all over the world laying hands on the sick and they recover. And uh, one day he's out on the mission field and he drops to the floor with a heart attack. And they rush into the hospital and they examine him. And of course he recovers, but he's in the hospital room in pain. And he's like, what in the world? He said, Jesus, why, why am I here? I, I, I travel all around the world teaching people about the goodness of God and the healing virtue of God. I lay hands on the sick and they, and they recover. And I have a heart attack. What in the world is going on? And he said, you got so busy with ministry that you didn't have time for me anymore. He said, you know, your first responsibility is not your ministry, but you ministering to me. And I realized that our worship is the phone number of God. It's the ringtone of God. All of our strength comes from spending time worshiping him for all the good things that he's done in our life. And in his presence, we come out of, like Moses came out of, the glory on our face. And then we go down and we change our world, right? But we can't just keep running around trying to change the world in our anointing and we lose our relationship with Jesus. We've got to go back into a place of worship with him and get recharged, re-encouraged, Remember, David encouraged himself in the Lord and find that place of heart connection with God. We weren't created really for ministry. We weren't even created to save souls, though that is one of the most important things we do. We were created for relationship with God, like Adam was in the garden. The only reason God invites us to be a part of ministry is because we can't do it without him, and therefore when we try to do it, we have to go to him all the time, and it keeps the relationship going. God could go like that and save the world, but he wants relationship. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below, and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.